Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to our guest. Any of you who are visiting with us, one visitor I wanted to pray for, he and his wife. I don't know where he went. Travis, Alan, and his wife are visiting. You raise your hand, Travis. There he is. Um, special welcome. He is on sabbatical and pastors the church in Greeley, and I just wanted to pray for their body together. Can you remind me the name of the church? Grace Church of Greeley, and Arlene Hamner comes from there and tells us it's the best pastor she's ever had. So, so this is a big deal to have Travis and his wife with us. So let's, let's pray for them. Father, we come before you, and I thank you, Lord, that you have called out this ecclesia, this beautiful uh, body of Christ there in Greeley. Lord, I thank you that you have given them a shepherd who loves them and teaches the word of God and that you're doing mighty things in their midst. Lord, we pray for this sweet couple that you would refresh their souls while they're taking time away and restoring for, unto a greater service for the King of Kings. And so be with them in a special way, God. I pray let them um, be encouraged with the saints of God in our worship here this morning. Lord, our brother and sister, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are studying through Romans. If you'll turn to chapter 10, we are going to finish up, Lord willing, chapter 10. And what a rich chapter this has been. We saw in 10.4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This righteousness that comes through God by faith in Jesus Christ. He tells us that God has come near in the gospel. He, he's come to earth in his son, and he's come even as close to our hearts. If we will believe in our hearts that Jesus uh, has been raised from the dead and confess with our mouth, he is Lord, we will be saved. And so he comes right into our hearts and takes up residence by his spirit. And then we saw the wideness of God's gospel intent with this death of Jesus Christ. It's for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord and this great blessing that will be poured out upon them. And then we looked at God's means for how he will dispense this gospel in a four-link chain. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And the second link is how then shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good news, missions and evangelism, our call that God is going to use us as the means to proclaim this gospel, to draw in his elect from the ends of the earth. And so now we will finish up the chapter with a break in this chain that we looked at last time. And that's going to be with the, the unbelief of Israel to this gospel. So how are they going to believe unless they're sent and called? And, and now there's this break where, where Israel did not believe. And we're going to look at even our own unbelief this morning. And so the break in the chain of this beautiful gospel is unbelief. So let's go to our God and pray. Father, I come before you this morning and I pray now as we finish up this chapter, Lord, that you would... Um, unfold this word. Holy Spirit, you have inspired it. I pray that you would illuminate it now into our minds and into our hearts. Lord, my heart is so full to look at the hands of God begging sinners to come. And so, Lord, I pray that, that um, I would entreat as if you were begging through me for people to come to Jesus Christ and be saved. I pray that um, the saints of God would be blessed, that you overcame our hardness and our obstinacy to this gospel, and you made it a treasure hidden in a field which we sold all that we might have it. To God be the glory for the grace that he has shown to us. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray these things. Amen. Well, Romans 10, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 21. Paul, as we're learning in Romans, is one to never leave a stone unturned. And now he's going to address a slight problem. Uh, Paul, that, I love what you're saying and what you're preaching, but if you haven't noticed, the majority of the Jews, when you're penning this, have rejected this good news that's going out. They've had a lot of beautiful feet come to them. They've had prophets and they've stoned them and they've killed them. They've had good news of good things. 
And as far as the Gentiles, they're just a minority that are believing it just like today as we sit this morning. And if you're so right, you would think more people would think so. More people would be embracing such a glorious gospel. And this verse we're going to look at is going to address that this morning. And some of you might not like what it says because it's the opposite of what America uh, churchianity calls successful evangelism. Paul knew and he prophesied that most are going to reject this glorious gospel that's going to go forth. Jesus Christ, when he finished the Sermon on the Mount, said only a few are going to enter at the narrow gate of Jesus Christ, and many are going to go down the broad road that leads to destruction. And if that's the case, do we figure out ways then to make the narrow way broader? You see, if we don't preach such a narrow way that you've got to surrender all to Jesus Christ, be stripped naked of all your pride and self-righteousness that we've been studying, and become desperate and cling only to Jesus Christ and lose your life for this king and live for him. Maybe tell them all the happiness they'll get and it'll be more fun. Your problems will go away, your kids will be better and you can handle stress easier. Preach that Jesus that, that you, you got to give them treasure on earth. If you come to him, they'll line up. Preach that he came to cure low self-esteem and you'll build a cathedral. Don't talk about sin and the, they'll have a, Houston, a stadium in Houston full. All they have to do is pray this little prayer and sign this little card or buy these indulgences. We've mastered the art of how to persuade people into making decisions. Gallup said that close to 60% of Americans have had a born-again experience that they claim. And what I have observed is the focus in the church is on results and not the message, and it's become diluted. And so to tell news, we saw last week or two weeks ago, it's news. It's God's news of what he's done in Jesus Christ. And so we don't make it up. We tell God's news, his story, his redemption. And what we've seen in this section is, is we're to preach the gospel, the, the message that has come from him. We're not called to convince people of, of the side effects and the other things that will come. The Christian life is more fulfilling than the non-Christian life. We're to tell them that their condition and their standing before a holy God is they're under his wrath and they need to flee to Jesus Christ who came into this world to save sinners among who I am foremost. And so our focus is God's message. And the result is God's. I can't make anyone born again. I can't raise anyone from the dead. I can't give eyes to see. I can't make Christ the sweetest thing that you have ever heard. I, I can't turn someone who's unwilling and make them willing. I cannot do it. What is more, the, Paul says there will be more rejection than acceptance if you preach the true gospel. And that is God's design. And so we can't change the message to get more success. And the result of that is if you do, the church will be more full of tares than wheat if we do that. And, the, and so do we want big churches to make it fun for unbelievers to come? Or do we want the ecclesia? It's a, a gathering of God's called out people to Jesus Christ. And so it breaks my heart when the message is peace, peace, when there is no peace. And we tell everybody they have peace with God when they don't. That's the kind of stuff we're going to look at this morning. I don't want anyone to, to die and stand before Jesus and him say, away from me, I never knew you because you were lied to with a false gospel. That's what this one little verse does for me this morning. It's huge to me. There's a misunderstanding of this truth and it's hurt the church greatly. So if you'll come with me to verse 16. However, however they did not all heed the good news that we saw in verses 14 through 15. <clears throat> Isaiah actually prophesied that this would happen. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? 
And Paul's going back to the greatest chapter on the work of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, that, that Christ bore our iniquity on the cross. And so now Paul quotes it. And so many times uh, with prophecy, you have this immediate application that Israel would reject the word of God and then this remote application that it's true in the age of Messiah as well. And so as we look at what Isaiah wrote 800 years before, he's saying they're going to refuse the Messiah. I mean, they're, they're, this is crazy. That they've been waiting and looking and their hope, the consolation of Israel. When is he coming? And Isaiah says that they're going to miss it. Just a small number is going to get it. They're going to miss what they've been waiting for from the history of this nation. And so the gospel is offered to all But all do not believe is what Paul's going now. It's for everyone. But all will not believe. And so he's going to begin to address that this morning a little deeper. And so he's going to say, you know, there's two kinds of hearing. There's a hearing and there's not a hearing. there's, There's hearing in the preaching of the gospel that leads to faith. You hear it and it brings faith. And there's a hearing that does not lead to faith. You you hear the words, but it never leads to this faith that we've been studying in Romans. It's interesting that the word hearing is used four times in these two verses here. In verse 16, our, our report, he says, you don't heed it. That's the root word for hearing. The verse 17, it's, it's used twice. And so this word for hearing has two meanings. It's the act of hearing. And all do this unless we're deaf. And the second one is that the thing that you do hear, it's through the act of hearing. What what do you hear? And in verse 16, he says, "For for, For they did not all heed the glad tidings of this gospel. And he goes to Isaiah, who has believed our report? Meaning, you heard it, who believed it? They did not respond to what they heard. They didn't get it. In verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. There's something different in what they hear in verse 17 and how they hear it. And what comes out of this hearing now, the gospel goes forth, the glad tidings of good news, and you hear it and it goes into your heart and you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and he's the Messiah, he's the Savior, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And so if, if we all have the same kind of ears, pretty sure, you know, we had this weird discussion in my house last week that some ears are attached and some are just floppy. Start looking at your neighbors. This is no joke. So we all have the same kind of ears, the same eardrums. And my question is, why do some hear differently when the gospel's preached? Why are some of you this morning, when you hear Jesus Christ, you're like, oh, my Lord and my Savior. And other people say, what's for lunch? Why do you hear the same words and you hear totally different things? I have people sometimes when they, they, they walk away and they'll say, why? And you talk with them and they never heard a thing you said. I had a gal come here 20 years, get saved, said, why didn't you just say it clear? Why don't you just preach the gospel? And she went back and listened to Galatians and said, you said it every week. (laughs) She had ears and she could not hear. And when the Holy Spirit all of a sudden is like, I hear, I see, this is Jesus, Messiah, my Savior. So there's two kinds of hearing that can happen. Why does one hear and have unbelief and another hears and has faith. That needs to be answered. And what might help is let's look at the uh, verse that he quoted elsewhere. (coughs) I want to read to you Isaiah 6, 9 through 10, that great chapter where Isaiah sees the king of glory. And God says to Isaiah, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return to me and be healed. 
they hear it in a way that they repent and turn to Jesus. Christ said, the reason I spoke in parables, two kinds of hearing. He says, I speak in parables in Matthew 13 because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear. And then he quotes that Isaiah passage. And so, blessed are your eyes because you see and your ears because you hear. You're blessed because you hear in a way that has brought faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel will always cause a division. And Paul said, to one, it's going to be morenos, foolishness. And to the other who hears, it's going to be the power of God for salvation. There's always two kinds of hearings. You had a thief on each side and one saved and one not. It will always be one will hear and it'll be dead, foolishness, and the other will hear and Jesus will be their treasure and they will believe in him as their savior. All people hear the same words, but not the same message. And that's going to happen here this morning. Revelation 2.7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who can hear by the Holy Spirit and has their ears open, listen to what the Holy Spirit says. There are two types of hearing, just mechanical and faith. And Romans 10.17 says, faith comes from hearing And hearing by the word of Christ, there's a special kind of hearing. How is faith produced? You may have heard sermons for 50 years as you sit here this morning. And the question is, have you ever heard in faith? Are you just constructing it? It's like algebra class that you took or geometry, uh, trigonometry. I never took it, but if you did, maybe it's like that. You're just kind of building and taking doctrines and stacking them, and you love seeing how they all fit together. But you've never heard. And you got all your little things dotted and crossed, and you fight and argue and debate, and it's never caused you to be born again and changed and transformed your life. Let's take a look at it. Faith, Paul says, comes ek. It comes out of, from what? From hearing. It comes out of hearing, and hearing, dia, by or through the word of Christ. And so this is the kind of hearing that faith comes out of. What sort of hearing is it that faith comes out of? Preaching is the most amazing thing in the world because the exact same words can have two different effects. It can harden a heart or it can soften a heart. It just goes forth and it accomplishes two things, life unto life or death unto death. Paul brings up Lydia, his first preaching in the the continent of Europe. He's in Philippi and he said, Lydia heard us in Acts 16, 13. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. She heard it. The Spirit opened up her heart, and she believed. In Jesus Christ. True hearing. Out of this kind of hearing, faith comes out. The Lord is the one who must give us ears to hear. And when he does, we'll hear and he'll go right into our soul and faith will come out in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says, a natural man, an unsaved man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. They'll always be moronic. It'll never make sense. You'll never get it. And they can't understand them because they're spiritually appraised. Spiritually, two plus two will always equal five for them. And so my friends, you can hear every word that the preacher says and not hear. But Lydia heard and she was gripped by him and she knew him to be true and believe in her heart and confess with her mouth that Jesus is Lord and she was saved. And so I just want you to consider your own experience. I've heard testimony after testimony and my own 
is I, I heard it as a child and I didn't like it. I hated it. I just wanted to know when was church going to get over? When could we go to lunch? And then there's one occasion as if the speaker was speaking only to me. And all of a sudden these words start going in. Now you're starting to hear in the true sense. And it's the word of God. And, and you're, you're now receiving and accepting it. And faith came out of that hearing. That is the testimony in all different ways of every life that God broke in. And suddenly you could have heard it your whole life. And now you heard it. And you're born again and you believe and your life has been changed. Hearing, he says, secondly, is by the word of Christ. The instrument that God uses for you to hear is the word of Christ. <clears throat> that is God's method of salvation. The, the word of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.21 For since in the wisdom of God... The world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of what? The message preached to save those who believe, the message of Jesus Christ. And indeed, Jews asked for signs and Greeks searched for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to us the power of God for salvation. It's the message of Christ. Salvation is in and through him, the one who died in our place and lived in our place with a faith always related to that message. And so we have two things that produce that kind of hearing that leads to faith and salvation. It's the operation of the Spirit and the message of Christ. And the product is saving faith that comes from a true hearing. It's the soil that was prepared that Jesus talked about in the parable that receives it and bears 30, 60, 100 fold. So when this word about Christ comes to us powerfully in the spirit, it's made efficacious, it's brought in, it comes in power by the spirit and we receive faith. That leads to salvation. Listen to James 1.18. And the exercise of God's will, his, he brought us forth, how? By the word of truth, Jesus Christ, that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.21, who through him, Jesus, are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living word of Christ. That word came and it caused you to be born again and believe in Christ. It's not enough to just hear. I'm after you this morning, okay? All you've done is hear your whole life and it's done nothing. Just a dead doornail to God and to Christ. Just arrogant, prideful, no fruit. And you just keep adding notebooks upon notebooks. Have you heard the word of God? It is not enough to just hear. It must come with power and conviction and assurance. And so we preach this message to the whole world. And Isaiah says, many are not going to believe with those beautiful feet that will go out and tell this gospel. But by grace, the gift of God, the Spirit will attend to some and bring this word about Christ with power. And they will respond in repentance and saving faith. And that's why we go to the nations, because the power of God can enter into any culture, any place, and save to God be the glory for salvation. So we don't change the message. It's this unadulterated message that we have seen in Romans that the Spirit uses to create this faith. It's this message that God uses to save. So I'm unashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. We don't change it. We preach it. We declare it. We, we pray and preach. That's our calling. And so we sit here this morning 
And we look to this God and say, Father, I wasn't any better. I wasn't smarter. I wasn't more intelligent. I wasn't more pliable. My salvation is all of grace. Let us hear this glorious message that landed on saving faith instead of unbelief in your life because of what the Spirit did when you heard that message and believed. So let him who boasts, boast in Christ. For by his doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now Paul's gonna address, yeah, but what about this? He's gonna take on the two big excuses for, for why I didn't believe. And so I want you to just sit here and see if those are your excuses, if you've come here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ. The first excuse in verse 18, if you'll look with me, <clears throat> but I say, surely they've never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So their excuse is, we didn't hear. What, why is it they haven't believed the gospel? Well, we didn't hear. And Paul says, no, it's not through a lack of hearing. In verse 18, and in the Greek, it's, it's a double negative that means certainly not. Of course you've heard it. You have heard it. They can't say that they didn't hear it because it's been preached, proclaimed. And he quotes Psalm 19.4 to defend it. And he says, their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. <clears throat> In them, he has placed a tent for the sun. And so Isaiah's text that Paul's quoting in Isaiah is it's not preaching the gospel. It's general revelation that he's quoting from, that the creation itself, the existence of God back to Romans 1 is declared by what he has made. And that's what Paul quotes and so I'm like, why are you quoting general revelation when we're talking about preaching the gospel? And I think what Paul's getting at here is that this revelation is continuous. Every day it's declaring the glory of God. It's, it's abundant. It's universal. The whole world sees it every day. And he's saying that the gospel is being preached everywhere. It's going out like general revelation. It's being declared. It's being told. It's being preached. John Murray said, since the gospel proclamation is now to all without distinction, what we learned in Romans 10, it's proper to see the parallel between the universality of general revelation and the universalism of the gospel. The former creation is the pattern now followed in the sounding forth of the gospel to the uttermost parts and the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So because of God's general revelation, there's not a spot in the universe not hearing the, the, the glory of God. And now the gospel is going forth into the world, to the nations. And so most likely Paul's talking representatively to it all. In Colossians 1, he says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which, Paul, I was made a minister. And so I think he's saying it's, it's going forth to all types of people everywhere, and they've heard it. So he's speaking generally now. This gospel is going out. It has not been hidden. It's been, he says Jesus was publicly displayed a propitiation back in Romans 3. Paul said to Agrippa, this has not been done in a corner of Jesus Christ. The gospel is now being preached everywhere and so you can't weasel out and say, I've never heard it. I don't know it. There's Christian churches in nearly every country. Radio, printed word, around the clock in America. And the Jews had heard it. He's saying the Jews, the Jews are saying, we, we, we didn't hear it. And they have no leg to stand upon because they heard. They just refuse to come to the cornerstone and surrender and believe in Jesus Christ as Messiah. And this excuse that they're pulling out isn't going to work for you either. To say, I just didn't hear. And the second excuse is I didn't understand in verse 19. But I say, surely Israel 
did not know, did they? They didn't get it. And Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. <clears throat> by a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. So they heard it. They just didn't understand what they were hearing. And, and, and Paul's saying, no, it, it was made very clear. And he quotes Deuteronomy 32, 21, uh, Moses. And in the context where he quotes Moses is Israel has gone after other gods. They've made God jealous, he says, by what is no gods. They're not even gods. And you're going after them like they are, and you've made God jealous. And now God says, I will make you jealous by them that are a no people. You're, you're going after no gods. I'm going to bring in the no people, the Gentiles. They're, they're, they're worshiping no gods. So I will take hold of people that you regard as dogs and foolish and rejected, and I will grant them salvation. And the great leader Moses told them, this is being fulfilled, Paul says. Isaiah is even more bold in verse 20. And he says, I was found by those who did not seek me, and I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. And as Sean read this morning, he's quoting from Isaiah 65.1. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. And I said, here I am, here am I, to a nation which did not call on my name. I was found. You sought me not. You sought me not, and I was... I was found by happy-go-lucky pagans. I became manifest to those who didn't ask for it. They were told that this was going to happen. This is prophesied. The Jews did, did understand the gospel because they were provoked to jealousy when the Gentiles, upon whom they looked so despairingly, are believing in it and being saved. You see, if the Jews didn't understand salvation by grace through the work of Christ, why did they have such an emotional reaction when it was proclaimed to the Gentiles? That they didn't just say, here's what I'd say, who cares about foolish Gentiles? Judaism's far superior. What's the big deal? That, that wasn't their reaction. Instead uh, of smugness and de detached superiority or jealousy and anger came out of them. They understood what was happening. And they understood what was being taught, fulfillment of Judaism. That's what made it so offensive. That's why they wanted to kill him and put Paul to death. They understood, but they didn't have epinosis, what we've been looking at, this getting the gospel from the heart and believing. They didn't have that. They just had some knowledge. They heard, but they did not hear is what Paul is showing us. And so there's no excuse. Hey, we didn't understand. So those who reject this gospel are culpable and held responsible. There'll be no excuses or no arguments on that last day. There's just guilt. And so all these things aren't going to clear it. And you spent your whole life using these arguments and they get you out of things. And when you stand before God, these arguments will not work. And now, before Paul ends his argument... He pulls out the big gun. I'm going to call it Moab. <laughs> the one that leaves all men inexcusable. The truth that heightens their condemnation to the fullest for the rejection of this gospel. And he quotes Isaiah 65, 2 in verse 21. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. This is the response if the Spirit does not act on your stony heart that is just rock solid. This is the way everyone will respond to this gospel, is this way. This is what will happen when you cry, I want my human responsibility to be sovereign determination of my life. Let, let that be the sovereignty of your life, your human will, and this is how every will will respond to this gospel when it goes forth. Robert Haldane, the great uh, commentator, said, we see what is the result when God employs only outward means to lead men to obedience and does not accompany them with the influence of his efficacious grace. This is what will happen if God doesn't act when that gospel is preached in your heart so you receive it. 
You will always be stiff-necked and obstinate. You'll reject this till you die. You will, you will go down resisting Jesus unless the Holy Spirit comes and does this. So anyone in this room, grace, that no longer responds to the gospel in this way should be overwhelmed that God has visited you and given you what you don't deserve. And he's allowed you to not be obstinate and hard till you die, but to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a gift. And so this is so moving to me to see the nature of God's compassion and his forbearance in contrast to the disobedient and obstinate rejection of the goodness of God by human beings. It just takes your, it just, I hope you don't get numb to this. Look at the compassion of God and the hardness of created ones. And so let's look at this as we close out, the nature of God's kindness and compassion. It's continuous. God is saying, I'm holding out my hands to Israel all day long. It's a Hebrew idiom for not just for a day, but just continuous. There's just this beautiful God holding out hands to Israel. Come, that you might have life. With God, a thousand years are as a day. And in the context of Romans, the gospel of grace is being offered to mankind. It's going out, it's being preached, and it comes with outstretched hands. And God is calling us to himself. He's appealing to us, come. Come, the creator of the universe is begging, saying, come. Come to me that you might have life. And he does it all day long. It's not just one offer. Not just one offer. You could be condemned for one offer. Israel, I've sent my prophets. Which ones didn't you kill? I've done it all day on and on and on. He says in Isaiah 5, what more could I have done for my vineyard to bear fruit? I did everything that you could bear fruit. And this holding out of the hands is compassionate. As we see on this earth, it's Jesus' hands. In Matthew 8, 3, it says, he stretched out his hand and he touched him saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. In Mark 10, 16, Jesus took them in his arms, the kids, and began blessing them and laying his hands upon them. In Luke 24, 50, he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and he blessed them as he departed. His hands were always blessing, healing, saving, and inviting their compassionate hands. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest for your souls. Come. Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17, the spirits and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty for living water, Come. Let the one who wishes to take water of life without cost, come, drink, living water, and never thirst again. These hands are held out in the gospel, and their hands that were bloodied and pierced through, and their sovereign hands upholding the whole universe, come, come to me that you might be saved and you might have rest of soul. Come. Our merciful God. Isaiah 30, 18, therefore Yahweh the Lord longs to be gracious to you and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. And if you remember when we went through Romans 9, I said this electing sovereignty of God was not a cold laboratory saying this lump's for honorable, this lump's for common, lose that. I see a God, a sovereign electing God who's holding out his hands all day long. Come. A God who delights in showing mercy, he's going to go through Romans 11 and show what he's done with the Jews and the Gentiles and what he's going to do at the end so that I could show mercy to all. I'm a merciful God. I'm a large-hearted God. I'm patient, a long-suffering God, a pleading God, even in the tender Christ who's gentle and humble in heart. Come. Paul says, I'm begging you to come as if God were entreating you through me. Come, you might have life. Yet no one can come unless it's been granted to you from the Father and he's given you ears to hear. The paradox of Scripture, or the mystery of Scripture, I'd say, not a paradox, forgive your pastor, 
Here is the tension then as you got the sovereignty of God and now we have the human responsibility. He's shown Israel that not all Israel is Israel. My sovereign election I, I drew out from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and then he showed that your human responsibility is you would not come, you would not believe. And so there's this, this tension, this beautiful truth of a God who elects and chooses his people and he sends the gospel out with messengers, with hands out saying, come, come that you might have life. Contradiction, no. There's mystery, yes. Scriptural, yes. And you try to solve that tension and you'll make nightmares on either side. And so I can say most boldly, if you see God as a cosmic killjoy, you've missed it. You need to keep this tension of the decree of God and the heart of God. And I know sometimes your brain says, I can't get it. Don't harden yourself with that kind of view of God. And what makes this so amazing is, is who he's holding out his hands to all day long. Look what he says in verse 21. I'm holding out my hands to who? Just these good, righteous, great people. No, disobedient and obstinate people. The Greek word for disobedient is apatheo, where we get the word apathetic. Just apathetic. They don't care. They won't obey it. They won't heed the call to take up your cross and follow after Jesus Christ. The gospel is a command to turn from sin to Jesus. Nothing that we resist so much as this command. Nothing we resist more. No command that we resist from God more than the command to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a command. Quit resisting it and being disobedient. That's the response to the outstretched hands of our creator, God. And he has these hands out and we spit on them and we slap them. So I don't want them. I don't want to hear your message. John 5.40, Jesus said, you were unwilling to come to me that you might have life. Come, and you just wouldn't. You were stiff-necked. Christ died and the veil is torn in two. We can now have approach and the Jews come and sew it back together. They rejected the greater sacrifice because they were content with their own. And some of you are content with your own this morning instead of the one of Jesus Christ. They rejected it. And Paul is saying it was foretold that this would happen. And so because of these outstretched hands, your disobedience and your obstinate heart, you can bring no argument on the day of judgment. You'll never be able to come and say, it's because of your election, I, did, I couldn't come. I want you to picture a king walking up to a bag lady saying, I want to make you my bride and a joint heir with my son. And she spits at him and says, I don't need your handouts. The picture here should break our hearts. If God was stretching out his hands to Israel then, how much more today? Jesus Christ has come into this world and he has accomplished salvation. And the messengers are taking this news throughout the world. And Jesus stood up in Matthew 23 and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. He sent prophets. They killed him. He sent his son. And they killed him. You're without excuse. And maybe you sit here this morning and your whole life he's been stretching out his hands to you. As a child, you had to, your parents faithfully teach you this gospel again and again and again, just stretching out the hands. And you had a faithful youth pastor stretching out his hands week after week. Come to Jesus. Believe. Be saved. How many entreaties have you heard now from me? Week after week, begging, pleading, as if God were entreating you through me. And you just sit here apathetic 
and obstinate, no matter what is said, no matter how we say it, what angle we come from, whether it's 10 different messengers as fishermen, you just keep being obstinate and stiff-necked. You're apathetic and obstinate to God. And here's the hard message this morning. If you perish, no one will be responsible but yourself. That's how God's designed this. It's going to be you that heard this beautiful, glorious message and just kept hardening your heart and being obstinate and apathetic to it all of your days. That's what he's talking about. You will never be able to blame it on election. I just warn you, I feel like I'll be an unfaithful pastor if I don't tell you this last point. Those outstretched hands that I love so much and they're so glorious and bright. One day those hands will be the hands of judgment. In Hebrews 10, 31, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God when now those hands will pour out wrath for all of eternity. And there'll be no excuses at the bar of judgment. Paul has shown the Jews but they're not saved because of sovereign election. And because of your human responsibility, you rejected Christ despite the outstretched hands of God continually just like creation. And you will have no one to blame but yourself for all of eternity. But I just was apathetic and obstinate and kept rejecting again and again and again. Come to Jesus and be saved. And I've been praying all week that your ears would hear the words of Christ in your heart and you would come to Christ and be saved. Be overwhelmed that God gave you ears to hear in such a way that your rebellion has been melted. My most joyful thing is Christ and coming to him again and again as to a living stone. I was so obstinate and the spirit came and let me hear. And now my greatest joy is to draw near to him and come. So praise be to God for taking away that apathy and that stiff neck to such a glorious savior. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for a gospel like this. These were some hard words this morning but your words and necessary words for our souls. God, I pray we've been laboring and looking at the glories of the gospel. And this morning you wanted us to consider the two kinds of hearing. And I pray that everyone in this room, Lord, you gave them the hearing that leads to the words of Christ that produce faith. Lord, I pray that no one would walk out of here without that kind of faith in Jesus Christ. And so Lord, be pleased to save any who have never come to you this morning. I pray, let their rebellion be thrown down and they would come to Jesus. And let the saints of God just rejoice again and again that we would have never been able to hear this message truly that produced faith unless you had opened our eyes and unplugged our ears and taken the heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh. God, we give you the praise and the glory. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.